All right, again, hi, I'm Cassie Wagner. I'm an engineering geologist, geologic engineer. But I like to go by geologists a little bit more frequently. I think that's the cooler side to be on. No offense to the engineers. All right, so in this presentation, we're gonna cover site characterization, which is the most important part that you are going to kick off your project with. And I'm not biased or anything as a geologist, but it is the most important part. Um, so during this presentation, we're going to look at determining when we're gonna recommend supplementary site investigations. We're gonna describe the types of investigations that are available for site characterization. We'll actually go into that in a little bit more detail in part two of this presentation after the break. Um, actually, a lot of these items, am I on the right presentation? Let me verify real quick. This is part one. Okay, well, these objectives span both of the presentations. Um, so there will be a break in the middle. Um, we're gonna look at engineering properties of earth materials. We're gonna look at how we identify geologic hazards at our site. And we're gonna really pay attention to how we recognize those data gaps and using the observational method to make sure that we're getting all of the site information that we're going to need for our project. So the importance of site investigation and characterization. Uh, we could just have this slide, I think, to cover all of site characterization, uh, just to, just to um, hone in on that importance. Um, there are four phases in general of site characterization. We start with our death study. We go through our site visit. We plan our initial site investigations, and then we plan our supplementary site investigations. And this graph is a um, image that shows the level of understanding on the y-axis and then time of our investigation stage on the x-axis. Um, a typical geotechnical data acquisition phase follows this curve on the bottom. That's what we do not want to see on our projects. We are not increasing our level of understanding by utilizing the death study, which is one of our biggest opportunities to understand our site. Uh, we're not using the site visit to, to really hone in on those observations that we made during our, our death study. And we're not using that site visit to properly inform our investigations, which means we get to our initial site investigations the first time our drill crew is out there or our team is out there mapping, and we're discovering a lot of things. And suddenly we're bringing our site investigation, our site understanding up to say 50%, whereas we should already be uh, have a much higher level of understanding of our site by the time our drill crew is out there. We're spending a lot of money at that time. It means a lot of that money might not be um, allocated to the correct resourcing to understand our site. We should also not be waiting until those supplementary investigations. Perhaps design is well underway. Maybe we're at the 90% design and suddenly we realized, oh, I think we need a dewatering program. Who's been on a project where you're almost to that level of design and, and there's a major lapse in understanding that's discovered? I think most of us have. Um, this curve is not what we want to be pursuing in our site characterization planning. What we want to see are these other curves uh, shown here on the top. Um, they, these are labeled as um, geology well done and geology less well done. But in both cases, this is, pretty, this is pretty ideal. We want to be using our death study to clarify as much as we can about the site possible. And I'm going to go through a lot of detail in a second about that death study because it is so important. You're getting 60 plus percent of your understanding of the site from this initial death study. And it's pretty inexpensive for your project. That site visit, we're confirming that working hypothesis that we built with our dust study. We're going out for all of our initial investigations and really we're targeting our engineering properties of materials and other factors, maybe exact levels of stratigraphic relationships and things like that that need to inform our design. And our supplementary investigations at the end, those are, those are always going to happen. They're always going to be critical, but we shouldn't be discovering major elements of our site at that phase. Uh, so this is another way of looking at that, um, looking at those stages. And this is also looking at it in terms of who is doing what. Um, so if you're the owner or client of the project, we've made the decision to initiate our feasibility study and go forward with the project. Now we have our site investigation specialist, our project engineers, and other team members engaged. We're, we're looking at that preliminary dust study, our preliminary investigations, and all team members are engaged. And as we move forward in time, you can go through this plot on your own. Um, this gives just a very simplistic and general overview of where we're at in our study um, given time and, and when those investigations should be taking place. Generally, a lot of your geologic investigations are taking place up front, uh, maybe at that 30%, 40% design level. You're already utilizing that information. So that, that information should already be available. All right, so let's dig right into the dust study, one of our most important parts. 
And this isn't just the geologist or site, speci or site characterization specialist. We are looking for, multi for all team members to be engaged at this point. But generally, this might fall on the whoever is conducting that site's, uh, con site characterization for the team. Um, here's Terzaghi. Terzaghi put forth the method of working, and this is something that we all still use today. And I believe that that article is available for you guys in your um, course information, um, the paper called Terzaghi's Method of Working. And really what he said is start big and narrow your focus. Your publicly available information is going to help you to understand the geologic setting, the geomorphic considerations of that setting, and then the hazards that you should be keying into and paying attention to given that information. And we are going to use that dust study to inform our site-specific data collection. Here's some excerpts from Terzaghi's method of working. And again, I highly recommend everybody check out this paper. It's a brief read, and it gives you a, a great uh, overview and, and some great ideas for when you're looking at this process. Um, and, and if you were to read this text, it says just that. You start big, and you narrow your focus. Uh, he starts at the library, and for us, we're going to be looking at a lot of online resources. And I'm going to go very, I'm going to go briefly over a few of the online resources that are available. Um, if you've taken the site characterization workshop, I know a few of you in this room probably have. We go into a lot more detail of conducting this dust study and those available online and free resources for everybody. Um, I, you guys can read through this a little bit more, but. Um, he's, he's making observations based on all of the publicly available information, and he's going to use that to build his working hypothesis or the working model of the site. And then he's going to use any subsequent information to refine that hypothesis. It's either confirming or, or contrary to what he's developed. Um, so in other words, we're using our site-specific, um, let, let me back up just a moment. Uh, this is a, just to reiterate the starting big and working our way to a more narrow focus. So first, when we're doing that dust study, the first thing we're really evaluating is the regional setting, um, the history of deformations at that site. That can even include the tectonic information, our climatic information, uh, the site stratigraphy and structure, and how all of that is going to apply to our much more focused uh, site-specific condition. And that's, as we narrow our focus, we're then looking at the area's depositional processes and the resultant geomorphology. So if we have a broad tectonic basin and we understand some of those regional deformations as a result of that, we're working on coastal California, we, we are gonna have a pretty strong understanding of those regional factors and the regional stresses. So as we start looking closer at our site, we're going to see how the resultant geology and geomorphology has been altered in line with those much broader regional factors. Um, and then lastly, we're, that's when we begin to ask the questions. Now that we have this understanding based on our dust study, how are those depositional environments going to inform our material properties or the spatial properties of things at our site, and ultimately some of the geologic hazards? Because all of that's going to inform what vulnerabilities I need to be on the lookout for, um, and uh, what, what other types of indications and evidence that I might be able to collect while I'm doing my site investigations that would inform those hazards. And I'm just gonna reiterate it one more time, start big and then narrow your focus. But this is the context of the, the death study and how we'll be going through it in the next couple of slides. Step one, we're looking at developing our relevant global tectonic model. That's the overall setting. Step two is we're in tandem looking at the geological and geomorphological, geomorph excuse me, the geomorphic model of your site. Um, that's going to give you that conceptual picture and that's when we're really gonna be able to identify the typical features we should be on the lookout for for those ge geologic and geomorphic models. And I'm gonna go through an example of those models in a second. Um, the next thing is that we're developing our preliminary site checklist. We're making a checklist from those models of, of all the items we're on the lookout for. And lastly, we're going to develop our initial working model or our hypothesis of the site. So that geologic setting, again, we're looking at those regional factors um, such as tectonic factors and, and other large regional um, type influences on the site. Um, you, on the right, there's a few images. This is, of course, is coastal California. We're looking at intense compression. We see shearing, we see th uh, thrusts and folds, and all sorts of structures that indicate intense deformation of my site. It also is going to tell me all about the 
orientation of a lot of these um, deformation features. On the image on the left, what I notice immediately from my look at the regional setting is a large anticline. I see the oldest materials in the middle of my in the middle of this image. I see Jurassic outcrops and items like that, and my materials are getting younger and younger, and and almost mirrored on each other. Um, of course, my project is right near the the crest of this large anticline, um, but it's coming off the hinge. So I'm thinking about that dipping strata, um, and items like that that are that are giving me some initial ideas of what to look out for at my site. And this is an image taken from one of the papers that uh, we've recommended. This is from a Fuchs paper that I believe is also available in your course materials. A lot of the information I go over for geologic models and geomorphic models is going to come from this Fuchs paper. So I highly recommend folks check it out. Um, I won't read through this, but essentially this is giving you some ideas of, of what we're looking for when we are identifying that tectonic and regional model. The geologic history, what are those active processes? It's going to be a major thing. Um, it, that's also going to help us identify major geologic features such as faults. Um, and just remember, your fault may not be exposed immediately adjacent to your site. Um, there's famous examples, Malpasse, for example, where within the site footprint, none of those indicators were present. They were never mapped, but it was those outcropping structural features um, upstream and downstream of the dam that ultimately failed that project. And there's a few of the activities that you can do to narrow down those objectives. Uh, so in the Fuchs paper um, published in 2000, there will there will be several tectonic models that are shown. I've just shown two here um, for simplicity. Here's, or actually I show I show one tectonic model here on the right. Um, there's there's a general overview of what to expect depending where you're working in the world. Um, but again, this is going to ultimately inform you on potential problems that you could have at your site. When I'm looking at this tectonic model. It's a little small for me to read here, um, but I, I'm seeing features that, that could ultimately impact my site if I understand exactly where I am. And this is especially relevant in, a, in your um, maybe very seismically active areas of the country. Um, definitely take time to understand the tectonic model for your site. Um, an example of how the same type of feature, a sedimentary basin, can be altered significantly based on that tectonic model. I just want to show that this is important. Um, here I have a sedimentary basin, and it looks very different if I'm in an in a intracratonic type tectonic model versus a foreland tectonic model, um, because it's impacting the type of materials I'm expecting at my site. Um, it's, going to, it's going to alter the type of depositional environments I'm going to be paying attention to. And when I have vastly different depositional environments, I'm also thinking I have vastly different material properties that I'm going to encounter at my site. So this is a great first stop to understanding what you're dealing with as you're going through that dust study. Um, so now we're going to step to step two from that flow chart. We have a good idea of our tectonic model. Now let's look at the geologic model. And remember in tandem, we're picking a geologic model and a geomorphic model. They are different, and I'll show some of those differences in the next few slides. Um, but let's start with our geologic models. Uh, geologic models are a simplistic view of the features and various geologic environments that you're going to encounter. Um, they're selected based on your rock forming environment, such as is, do you have sedimentary rocks, igneous, metamorphic at your site? Also the initial stratigraphy, the tectonic um, changes that may have altered the site. Um, so there's a number of them. I think in the Fuchs paper, there might be up to like 22 or so. Don't quote me on the exact number of different geologic models. There's only a few that you're going to probably be using repeatedly in dam design. Um, so shown here on the slide, I believe this is our, uh, here we go, sediment. It's a sedimentary rock, continental fluvial, colluvial, and lacustrine environments. Of course, dams are built on rivers. So you'll definitely be using this geologic model quite a bit. Um, Overall, these models give you an idea of what lithologies you can likely expect in that environment, um, the settings that they likely form in, and the processes that likely affect it. So if, if you were to look closely at this image, um, I'm seeing some of those initial features that I should definitely be um, keying into as they're going to be relevant to my site in this model. Alluvial terraces, abandoned me uh, meanders, um, the potential for avulsion, which is a major change in the river position. Um, I'm thinking about my fining upward sequence 
Generally, as that river is moving around, you're going to see the coarsest material at, at depth and it finds upward for that particular river location. Now, as it changes, it might come back to that location. So you might see multiple instances of a finding upward sequence. Um, you might have braided alluvium conversely, which would be maybe a more high energy area. You're, you have a little bit of a steeper slope to get a, a braided channel versus those meanders are going to form at very low gradients. Um, there's a lot more features shown here, and it gives you an idea of where in your model to expect those features um, and, and what type of features that you should expect and be on the lookout for and be thinking about. Here's another example of a geologic model, another one that we might encounter in our dam design. This is again with sedimentary rock. Um, this is a continental deltaic or coal measure environment. And it might not be that this geologic model is the, the active process. We're not necessarily just talking about Holocene geology. This might have been something that is, is a much older event, but that is the relevant stratigraphy at my site. Um, has anyone worked on a site that is near an old delta? They can be pretty interesting. Uh, one of the things that's, that's really different about working on a delta is you see a coarsening upward sequence instead of a finding upward sequence. So if you're conducting your investigations and you're seeing that, you should really be thinking of delta, which is also going to change some of the, the ways I'm thinking about the foundation at my site and some of the things it might be vulnerable to. Another example is the igneous uh, and plutonic intrusions geologic model. This is a great one. Um, maybe you're working in the mountains, maybe you're working in the somewhere in the Appalachians and your site is on a uh, some igneous plutonic rock. What do you think would be more likely here? Do I have possibly an embankment dam or is this a, a good setting for a concrete dam? A nice hard rock dam foundation. All right. Well, this would be a site potentially that we might have a concrete dam as well. And some of the considerations we might be making for a concrete versus an embankment dam, I know this is embankment dam design here, uh, might be a little bit different, but you can still definitely have embankment dams in these types of environments. Um, and again, some of the things we're looking at are the way the rock weathers is going to be extremely important. Um, you might have a core rock that is weathered um, above, below, and all around the sides of, of the core rock feature. Um, the, the weathering material might be something that is subject to erosive forces. Uh, so there's, there's definitely some really unique things that we'd be looking for here. Um, and that's actually, it's described in this geologic model of, of some of those factors. So now we're looking at geomorph geomorphic considerations. And again, we're, we're kind of doing this in tandem, but they are different. Um, geology is a process-based discipline. We're using our process-based thinking to understand our site and to inform our key considerations for potential failure modes at our site or things that could impact our, our dam design. Um, the geomorphic models are describing how your site is locally modified. So I have my geologic model, my fluvial environment, and now I'm thinking, how, how am I locally altering that site? Um, geomorphic processes often relate to the current climate um, or near recent climate. We might be thinking of the Holocene when we're thinking of, um, of our geomorphology. One thing we don't want to necessarily be thinking about is much older processes. So if I'm working on a site in Texas and I'm looking at some, in, some, some things that happened back in the Pleistocene that maybe induced a lot of landslide activity or ground movement, I need to really be thinking carefully of, do those conditions still exist? Uh, today in our current climatic environment to still cause that type of geomorphology. And I, I've seen that quite a bit, not just in Texas, but all over um, the Southwest and other areas of the country that was that these areas were prone to intense flooding and extremely high intensity rainfall in the Pleistocene or during these interglacials. And you might have seen huge landslides or, or intense mass wasting that perhaps just isn't plausible in today's climatic environment. So just remember to be thinking about probably our Holocene type environments when we're looking at the geomorphology. Um, here's some examples of geomorphic models of our dams. Uh, these two we're looking at are, are two different types of glaciation. So on the left, we have alpine glaciation. A great example is Rocky Mountains. We have a lot of dams in the Rocky Mountains. And on the right, we have continental glaciation, which is much of the Northern Midwest. Maybe we're working in North Dakota or, or separate, uh, several areas like that. 
One of the things you'll notice is that even though glaciation is used in both of those words, there's quite different features. In the alpine glaciation, we're, we're going to be looking at um, features like, let's see, um, the, the crevasses that form, um, the lateral moraines are forming in a little bit of a different orientation. We're looking at hanging valleys, um, of course, all of the mountain type features. We're probably not building a dam all the way up by the, the horn of a, of a glacial area, but, but we do want to be thinking about how the glacial geomorphology has really carved out and altered our local areas. When we look at continental glaciation, we are again looking at the orientation of how that glacier moved across the site. The glacier would have advanced and it would have retreated and it advanced and it will advance and retreat in cycles as well. Um, so you might see that terminal moraine at the very furthest location that that glacier advanced to and you're going to see varying levels of moraines as the glacier annually retreats and advances on its net trend of retreating during the Pleistocene time. Um, so just pay attention. You will find a lot of very interesting features on in sites that were subjected to glaciation. Um, you know, loose flow till in a bedrock hollow. Well, that's a that's a major concern if I'm building an embankment there. I need to be able to identify these features and to anticipate where they might have occurred at my site. Um, and what those geologic or geomorphic models provide for us in a paper such as Fook, Fooks et al is it describes what to anticipate for each of these environments. So these are just two SNPs from the, the, the um, alpine glaciation and the continental glaciation of what should I be anticipating if that's my site? And it gives you some really great information as you're doing your site characterization of what to be on the lookout for. Um, here's a great ge geomorphic model. This is most of the continental US, our fluvial environments and a temperate climate. Um, we see possible erosion and landslide activity. We see the talus and colluvial slopes, um, of course, our, our actual fluvial geomorphology, and other ways that this river is actively altering our site. There's a great definition also on a profile. Um, you, you can even see how our dam is going to be constructed, perhaps, across this valley, and things that we should be thinking about in terms of the, the geo, geomorphology or geomorphic terms for the different zones. But that informs us what type of materials I'm expecting in each of these zones, what type of weathering process I'm expecting, and how I should treat each of these zones differently as I'm going through my site characterization. Um, here's another great example. This is most of the American Southwest. Has anyone worked in, say, New Mexico or any of the Southwest areas of the country? All right, we have a few. These are some of my favorite dam sites. They're, they're fascinating. They have really, really cool geomorphology. Um, you can look at this, these features in a lot more detail on your own, um, but there's going to be unique things that I'm thinking about here that I'm not thinking about in my other environments. And this is a reminder, again, of all of those features I should be on the lookout for. I have two more. Um, the one on the left, tropical environments, maybe we don't see that as much if we're practicing in the, the US, but if you're practicing international, you will perhaps have the opportunity to work in a tropical environment. Again, unique considerations to consider make sure you understand each of your geomorphic and geologic models for the site you're working on in the area of the country you're working on. On the right, I think a lot of us probably have seen a karst site. Has anyone worked on a karst site? Yeah, those, are, those can be pretty frightening. There's a lot of features and a lot of irregular features and a lot of often unpredictable features. We will do our best to understand uh, the site. And again, here's a lot of these geomorphic terms for features I'm on the lookout for when I'm working on a, a site that has been subjected to karst. Um, but, but definitely do your due diligence on the front end so that you can get the best investigations possible in your karst environment. You don't want to get out to construction and find there was a large solution feature that was missed, perhaps, which invariably will happen probably on a karst site. Um, but, but again, understand what you should be on the lookout for. Karst is interesting because it likes, you know, the ground table, the groundwater table might be constant for a long time. And so you get a lot of dissolution on a horizontal part of the limestone strata or, or whatever material, you know, dolostone that you're dealing with that's subjected to karst. And then there might be a, a more rapid, rapid and geologic time uh, change in that water surface elevation and where the groundwater is now going to be stable. So you'll see some vertical solutioning features and then a, another network of horizontal features. Um, that becomes quite typical. Uh, so this is a bit of a summary. 
Uh, and just as a reminder, we, we're never going to have perfect sub, uh, subsurface information. So we're thinking of our foundation in terms of our understanding of the variability that's, that's possible um, from all of our different various depositional environments. Um, this is a great summary slide from best practices of if I'm working in a, in a deltaic environment, I'm looking for grain sizes of all of, of the full spectrum, probably gravel to clay. Um, and I'm looking for probably highly continuous strata. And you can look at these other environments to see how we would generally think of strata in terms of continuity, which becomes extremely important for our internal erosion type failure modes. Um, and also maybe our grain size distribution um, and, and our relative grain size variability. And this is just a summary. This is just a way to get you started when you're thinking. But these are the things you have to characterize when you're looking at a site, especially for a dam design. All right, so I'm walking out, we're building a new dam, and I find out, oh, this site was subjected to glaciation. What are some of the questions I'm asking for engineering significance? Um, you can read through these, but I'm, I'm really thinking of, of these type of features that may have altered my site. And uh, just to save on time, you guys can read through those, but those are just examples for a glacial environment. Overall, glaciers are very powerful. Um, they have a significant effect on the engineering considerations for your site in terms of what I'm thinking about for seepage, stability, the stress regime. So be sure no matter what site you're looking at, you're thinking of those factors. Um, climatic considerations, we kind of already touched on this, but we're thinking of more recent things. We're thinking of the Holocene. Um, here's some examples of, of why this becomes important. And the, the main thing is weathering. Weathering at your site can, can really make or break an understanding and, and it can significantly alter the engineering properties um, within the same units. So characterizing your weathering is, ex is extremely important. Um, if your geologist on the site is probably going to be logging materials separately as they move through different weathering regimes. They're also probably going to find a system for, um, there are very well established systems for describing that weathering. Um, generally we use a scale of one to nine in the field where one is completely fresh and nine would be completely decomposed and on its way to soil. That's one example. Um, I suggest not to advertise for the other agency, but the Bureau of Reclamation um, Engineering Geology Field Manual is excellent. I recommend everybody get a copy of it. And volume one is going to have all of those field mapping descriptions for things like weathering. Um, really what we're thinking about in terms of our climate is the relative subjectivity to mechanical weathering versus chemical weathering versus mass movement of materials, um, the fluvial actions that we generally expect, and the wind actions that we generally expect. And it varies significantly. Um, in a glacial environment, there was significant wind action, and there's definitely significant um, mechanical weathering. We see that frost jacking of our rock and the materials. Uh, we might not see much chemical weathering, though. It's cold. There's not a lot of opportunities for that. But in a wet, humid, tropical environment, we're going to see a lot of chemical weathering. Remember, atmospheric water is slightly acidic. And if you're in a site with a lot of rainfall, that slightly acidic rainfall is definitely altering the materials at your site. Here's some more um, climatic considerations. Definitely read through these um, you know, after the class. Think about your sites in that context and what it means for weathering at your site. All right, so this is an example from best practices. I bet a lot of folks have seen this before, um, but we're gonna go through thinking about geomorphology. So I go to my site, I didn't do a death study. Uh, I skipped that, didn't seem worth it. Uh, so I'm just, I'm just gonna go straight for some drilling. So I identified these two locations for my drill holes and I got some great results. And I'm sitting in my office and I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna connect the dots. I think this makes sense. Everything looks pretty layer cake. I'm going to run this through my, my slope W and my, my seat models. Um, when in reality, if I'd paid attention to my geomorphic, geomorphic model or my geologic model, I would have certainly identified that the historic extents of the Santa Cruz River have, has actually moved across this site pretty significantly. And I've, I've missed some pretty significant geology. Um, this coarse grain strata depth that's probably subject to a lot of seepage. Um, I don't know what these materials are, but, but I've completely missed the mark by not understanding my site before I went out and did my drilling program. Also, I would have probably put those drill holes in quite different locations to understand the geologic variability at my site and within this floodplain had I spent some time with it. 
And it's actually, it's quite easy for you to, to try and understand the paleo extents of that river channel, um, but it's something that should be done during the dust study. All right, so dust study resources. This is just a few, there's a lot of resources. And again, I'll put in a um, I'll vouch for the site characterization workshop. You'll go into a lot more detail of this. One thing I think everybody should bookmark on your site if you ever are involved in geology type um, characterizations is the National Map Viewer by USGS. And if you were to just um, Google search USGS NGMDB, that's the, oh gosh, I'm not gonna remember the full acronym, but it's the National Geologic Mapping Database. That's actually what it stands for. Um, but or you could just type in map, map view, USGS map view. Once you get there, you're going to see the entire United States. You're going to zo zoom into your location of interest, and you're going to see all of the documents identified in your area of interest um, for uh, that area. You know, here I, I've pulled up the quad map, um, but you can download all those resources. You can find papers. You can find publications. That's the download button. Um, another resource is the USDA NRCS Web Soil Survey. Um, this one you can bookmark on your computer by just Googling um, NRCS Web Soil Survey. And in fact, I think if you just type in Web Soil Survey, you should also get to this page. Um, generally, you'll land on this page here. Press the big green button to start the Web Soil Survey. And again, there's going to be a series of upper tabs and lower tabs as you walk through, zooming into your area of interest and your site. Um, there's going to be a lot of information about the surficial soil, and, and that's going to give you some basic starting information for different processes at your site. Here's a few more resources that I personally think are very useful. Um, there's the full National Map Service. There's going to be a lot of other mapping applications within that. This is all part of USGS. Um, again, there's the Geologic Map Database. That's the one I've already shown. Um, the Mineral Resource Data, that's what the mrdata.usgs.gov stands for. Um, this offers a lot of GIS downloads. It's The mapping is a little bit more simplistic. It is a national mapping effort, so it attempts to rectify. If, if you're looking at your quad maps, you'll see that on, along a state boundary, there will be perhaps um, things that are not consistent across the state boundary. They were mapped different by different geologists at different times. Um, the national map does make an attempt of rectifying some of that. It's a great, I keep this GIS download on my computer at all times. It's a great start for looking at things. And the last one is the geologic names lexicon. This is very important, especially if you're looking at an existing site. Geologic names change with time or different geologists named the same formation in different locations, different things. Um, and I've definitely come across that on many projects where they're referring to a formation and you go to look it up and you're looking at the geologic map and you're like, what on earth, are, what are they talking about? I don't see this formation anywhere. Well, it's a historic usage, but this lexicon is, does a very good job of, of cleaning all of that up. You can type on any formation name. It's gonna tell you what the current usage is. And it'll also tell you all of the different past usage, especially as they vary across different states. Uh, so that's a great one. Um, other sources of information that I'm looking for in this dust study, uh, if there's any existing engineering reports, um, if it's a new dam, there's still a possibility that there are previous studies. Um, there's also reports for public works in the area. There's probably a nearby water well. Um, there might be a nearby road. There might be a near, nearby railroad track. And all of those different agencies likely have information that can help inform your dust study. It's existing. A lot of money was spent on those previous investigations. So take the opportunity to pull it into your dust study. Um, if you're looking at rehabilitations, there's probably a lot of information already on that dam. Other um, items would be, of course, those highway maps, our topographic maps of the area, geologic maps of the area, agricultural soil maps. We went over all of those. Also look for aerial and sat satellite photography. You can get a lot by um, paying close attention to the features shown. Uh, hydrologic data can be very important. You might find some great information about the aquifers in the area. That also gets you thinking about your site. Um, O.C. Fisher is a great example of where groundwater data um, and, and hydrologic data was, was great in helping to inform some of the site geology. Um, also land ownership maps. All right, so now we're to part three of our, over, of our initial site characterization. And that's our site visit with the entire team so the first time I'm out at the site, and we're, we're assuming I'm out here for a new dam construction, 
Um, we, we are looking at all of those locations of any previous and potential field exploration activities. At this point, I've gone through my full dust study and I have a pretty good idea of the features I'm interested in, what I think is going to be present at the site. I looked at all the aerial photography. There's a couple zones I'm keying in on and perhaps we have some initial ideas of, of how the site might be laid out. Um, I'm looking at site access. You know, in this case, this is a photo I took from a project in New Mexico. And we're standing down here on the floodplain, and there's there's a lot of issues with this right abutment that's shown in the in the photo. And we needed to access for investigations locations that were just were relatively um, inaccessible. So we had to be very flexible with our investigation. We had to consider a lot of other types of methods to get our multi like a a much more holistic approach to characterizing those materials. They were very very difficult to characterize at this location. Has anyone worked in sites that are so remote that you had a helicopter in your drill rig? Yeah, just a few. It happens. Sometimes you're building a site in an extremely remote location, and it can be extremely tricky when you're planning these initial investigations for how you're going to access the site. Maybe there's intense vegetative cover, and you're having to plan out drill roads and things like that. So start very early on the site visit. Remember to have your whole team on site. This isn't just where the geologist runs out or the design engineer runs out. You want your entire exploration team on site. I normally would always recommend, of course, your site characterization team, your design and engineering team. Um, you're going to have the actual field personnel on site. So have your, your driller um, on site, the field geologist on site. Uh, you might bring lab members, um, especially if you're doing a mix of in situ testing to get your engineering properties and you're sending other things back to the lab. It might be extremely beneficial to have the lab personnel on site so they can also get a really good understanding of what we're looking at, what we're dealing with. Um, so I can't stress enough to bring that entire team to your site. Uh, so when I'm doing a reconnaissance of the general area, um, there, these are some tips that were provided. Don't design the project in the field. Well, you are thinking about the design and the design features that may be implemented. Um, but but think about the site, it, you know, this is our initial site visit out there, um, or maybe the initial site visit with the full team. So we're thinking of possibilities at this point as well. Um, you know, we're looking, we're going to design our project once we have all the adequate data that we need to evaluate the alternatives for all the issues. So we're thinking about possibilities. Um, when we're looking at the dam site, we're making observations like, man, this is a pretty narrow valley. Um, those are pretty steep slide slopes, and I'm, I'm already keying into things I'm going to be concerned about. Is there valley stress relief jointing that are going to be continuous discontinuities upstream and downstream of my dam? I'm looking at the foundation and the, the valley bottom conditions. Um, are parts of the valley bottom founded on rock, or is it a deep, deep, deep soil? Um, where would the pertinent structures be located? Where are some good opportunities for a spillway? Where are some good opportunities for my borrow areas? Um, you're also looking in the reservoir area. You're thinking about the stream gradient. The stream gradient is very important to the resulting geomorphology. Um, you're thinking about how that reservoir is going to be expanding upstream. Always consider your upstream. You have case histories like Viant, which failed because of an, an upstream reservoir slide, which caused the reservoir to then overtop the dam and there was a lot of loss of life in, in that failure. You're thinking about the reservoir containment because that might um, provide information where other pertinent structures will have to be located. And you're thinking about the sedimentation, debris and flow, landslides and everything like that. So this site visit is, is very important to cover all areas, walk the whole site and be thinking about everything that you keyed into on in your dust study. The multidisciplinary team, you're going to have a lot of different folks and these always should be involved from all stages. Um, the death study should pr be presented to this entire team. The team's gonna be involved from the site characterization or the site visits onward. Um, we have our project managers, our geologists, our field personnel, different engineers, drilling specialists, lab specialists, instrumentation, um, of course, environmental and cultural specialists. And even within geology, there's a lot of us, there's a lot of different types of geologists. Um, you'll have folks on the team looking at seismology, maybe the quaternary geomorphology, uh, which might be our seismic hazard characterization, fluvial geomorphology, the engineering geology folks, that's classifying the engineering properties of our earth materials, groundwater, rock mechanics, soil mechanics, and of course our field expertise. So now we're to our initial site in investigations. The biggest thing is that you set clear objectives for all of these investigations. 
every type um, of investigation must be appropriate. We need the appropriate quality of investigation and quantity of data being collected. And again, that's why we're using our entire multidisciplinary team. The engineer might be saying, I need these specific variables that are going to come from certain types of laboratory testing, which means I need to do a triaxial a test on all these different types of materials, which means that when I'm planning that investigation, I need to make sure that I'm allocating the correct sampling techniques, the correct drilling techniques, and in the correct locations to get the appropriate number of samples that are then going to be handled correctly on their way to the lab so that the engineering team can get the, the parameters that they require um, for their analysis and, and for their design. So that's why this should never be done in a vacuum. If you're planning that site investigation, you're starting with the entire team and the design needs, this very specific design needs, because there might be a large number of variables that are required for different locations across your site when they're looking at things like consolidation or, or um, any other type of loading that's going to be at the site. Let's see. We're assessing if our investigation plan is going to be rep representative of all the conceivable deviations. And those conceivable deviations and conditions are based, again, on what we found out during the death study. We might say, you know what, it's certainly conceivable that we're going to have some very low stress or low density areas in these locations of the foundation. And I'm going to do my best to gather that information, even if I don't know exactly where these features might be located. That's what you're thinking about of representativeness of materials. Um, as those results are coming in, you're condensing and clarifying the information immediately. Um, investigations are going to offer a range of values, and it's an incomplete data set. So I'm, I'm looking at a subset of the actual conditions, and it's my job to make sure that these are still representative of the ranges that I expect to encounter at my site. And I'm communicating to the rest of the team as this information is coming in how representative that actually is, and perhaps if we need to alter any of our investigation plan. Successful in investigations are going to improve your results um, by, or things you can do to improve your results of your investigation are going to be observe the site continuously, um, carefully select your field and lab methods, report the data as ranges. Um, even as I'm logging as a geologist within one stratigraphic unit, I'm going to see a range of, ver of, of values. So I need to make sure that I'm communicating that range of values appropriately, especially if there's any sort of trend, like a um, coarsening with depth of my grain size distribution. Um, I'm also looking at similar sites, and I'm also thinking about case histories. I'm looking to understand all of these items during my investigation, um, and you guys can read that. One of the big things here also, um, I'm thinking about the constructability at my site, handling, processing, and building with the soil materials at my site. You're, you're definitely keeping in mind that information as you're going through your investigation. A little bit more on condensing and focusing our geologic information. It's not useful to the design team until you've condensed and clarified and summarized it in a meaningful way. Um, geologic figures is often what that means. This is great for communication to your team. Um, if I walk in and I have a mountain of reports on my, my project, that's not very useful. The design team doesn't necessarily have the full time to go through and make all of the evaluations from that information. The, the site characterization specialist should be condensing that information to, into something that is extremely useful to the team so that critical details are not missed. Um, this is a chart giving just a, a general example of uh, condensing and focusing multiple sources of information. Um, they have five different investigation methods that were performed, and each, each of those had measurements and measurement results, um, investigation results, and a report. So our job at this point is compiling those results from various investigations, estimating the ground conditions based on this disparate data, and providing a report on the ground conditions. And that might be something you see, if you're looking at a historic project, you might see these preliminary geologic investigations report. And that would be one report from a multitude of different sub-reports. Um, here's an example of a landslide. Um, in this case, I, I have my coring information of joint, in, or, uh, joint orientations. I have uh, a review of aerial photography, and I think I've identified a few lobes to this landslide. I'm thinking about how it's moved over time, and I'm, I'm putting this together for a conceptual model of my landslide. What are some other things that I might ask for um, to help better characterize my landslide? Maybe these are things that exist or things I need to ask for. What about lab testing? I'm probably interested in the residual shear strength. 
but then I need to understand how to get that parameter. What type of coring and lab test, or, you know, coring and drilling method I need to use to get the appropriate sample that is going to transfer to the lab so that they can do the appropriate test and, and get those values. I might be looking at groundwater, maybe I'm looking at regional groundwater that data that already exists, or maybe I'm going to request information um, as, as part of my investigation. But this might have been a site where we want to construct a new dam, but there's landslides in the area. And I need to understand exactly what I'm asking for once I review this available information um, to better understand that feature. And this is just one of my big hints for focusing information is think of the critical questions. You have a lot of information. Say we're looking at a dam that we already suspect the foundation is going to be subjected to uh, the potential for internal erosion then I'm, I want to answer questions related to the geologic vulnerability to internal erosion or the potential for that material to even migrate. Um, I want to answer questions about the flow characteristics, where's the water even flowing, and what the continuity of any of my erodible materials looks like. So when I'm thinking of, of how I'm focusing my information and in creating geologic figures and putting together stuff to hand to the design engineer, um, I, I'm looking at these, these different approaches or multidisciplinary methods that will individually inform. And again, one geologic exploration method is not going to answer all of our questions. So we have to take a multidisciplinary approach. You know, think about corroborating evidence at a crime scene. You can't just have one fingerprint. You maybe need some witness testimony and um, maybe there's a video or um, other types of data at your crime scene to help solve the case. Well, this is what I'm doing in the subsurface because I, I can't see what happened in the subsurface. Um, so I'm using the techniques available to me to try and inform each of these questions from different, from different angles. All right, so here's the steps of planning our initial investigations. Let's see, I'm at 46 minutes right now, so I think we're right on track. Of course, we already talked about inter uh, determining our investigation objectives. We hopefully have already confirmed our team, our multidisciplinary team. Um, let's see. We're going to align our investigation objectives with the results of my dust study. We talked about that. So I think that folks have a, a good understanding right now of, of what we're meaning by aligning those investigations. We're looking for areas that we already identified as having potential vulnerabilities um, or potential variability at the site. Hopefully we've already done our site visit. Um, if not, get out to the site, look at things. Um, we're going to, at this point, put together our drilling program plan or there's other terms for it, field exploration program, um, but our site investigation. And as we're putting together that plan, we're also going to be seeking NEPA and NHPA compliance. That's our environmental and cultural compliance activities. So just to go into detail about a few of those, determining our investigation objectives. Of course, at this point, we already have an idea of what we might be looking for. Um, for new structures, again, I'm thinking of my regional geology I'm thinking about the locations, the sequences of strata, the thicknesses of those strata, the aerial extent of items as I'm locating those sites. Um, I'm thinking about the bedrock. I'm thinking about the groundwater, because that also might alter how I am approaching my site or my investigations. Um, if I need to do in situ testing, such as an SPT, and I'm above the groundwater table, well, that's pretty straightforward, right? But once I get below the groundwater table, I have to be very, very careful as I'm conducting in situ testing, like an, like an SPT, that I'm not having heaving in the bottom of my hole or I'm creating low density areas and getting artificially low blow counts. So I'm going to have to alter, I might have to add water to my drill hole. If the artesian pressure is excessive beyond just adding water to the borehole, I might be adding a weight to that mix. If I'm putting in a piezometer, should I use bentonite to weight my hole? What do you guys think? No. Bentonite's going to make a nice core wall of impermeable material in my drill hole. There are other things you can use, like a polymer additive, that will break down, um, but you can weight your drill hole that way. All right. Anyways, you have to clearly be able to state the purpose of each of your investigation techniques and exactly what it's adding to your site. Um, jumping forward, aligning our investigations with the dust study. This is where I'm really showing that I have appropriately identified my investigations to the right locations. Um, maybe I know about terraces. This is a project in New Mexico, and I've, I've been evaluating this, this, these aerial, um, aerial images compared to uh, topographic mapping. And I'm, I'm drawing out the locations of terraces in the, in the area. 
Um, another example, steeply incised bedrock in the area is prone to vertical valley stress relief jointing. That's a major one for our dams. That's an upstream to downstream discontinuity that can be very dangerous to your site. You have to understand these types of discontinuities. Um, and so these are things that I need to make sure that I'm aligning because I, I knew that from my desk study, I knew I probably had these discontinuities. Now I need to go find them and characterize them. Um, developing our drilling plan. Again, what are the defined objectives that I've now set based on all my questions from my desk study? And what do I need to do to meet these objectives? And this is an example of, of liquefaction. I'm a little concerned that the site that I'm about to build on has the potential for liquefaction in the foundation. There's going to be a lot of questioning, a lot of questions and a lot of in-situ testing that I'm likely pursuing at this point. So planning that field investigation, we might be looking um, at a number of different sources for that investigation. I might first be considering non-intrusive or um, what we would call accessible options before we go to inaccessible. And the definitions there, inaccessible is our drill hole. That's going to be something that's not accessible to a human even while we're conducting it. Non-intrusive might be something like geophysics from the surface. Um, we're, not, we're not destroying anything in the ground. Accessible might be a test pit or a trench. This is something that is easily accessible and myself as the geologist can go down into a, a test pit or a trench and map the sidewalls and things like that. Um, while I'm planning my investigation, I, again, I'm thinking of the size and type of the feature being investigated. Um, I'm documenting the anticipated materials that likely will be encountered because that's going to inform my methods. And I'm not going to send a hollow stem auger out to drill through something extremely bouldery or gravelly because I'm going to hit refusal, I'm going to break my equipment. The driller is going to be pretty mad at me that I sent him out there like that. So I, I might be looking at sonic in a gravelly environment or, or coring or other types of methods. Um, reviewing that proposed laboratory testing and making sure that everything in your drilling plan aligns with what is going to be required by the lab. When I'm sending my field geologist out, I can't expect that, that they have a full understanding of all of the laboratory testing that's going to be asked at the site. That means that you have to communicate in your drilling plan exactly what the sampling, handling, and collection techniques look like. If you're doing a Shelby tube, what all do I need to do when that Shelby tube comes out of the ground? I need to weigh it, I need to take certain measurements, I need to clean it, I need to cap it. That needs to be understood by your field team so that the correct um, materials are getting to the lab so that they can do the correct testing. Reviewing instrumentation, borehole completion requirements. Where should we be putting in instrumentation? We'll talk more about instrumentation tomorrow. And then, of course, considering our feature accessibility. There's always obstacles at your site. There's always utilities. And there's always a drill hole that you need somewhere where there's just no way to get a drill rig. So that's all things that you have to think about and, and prioritize and optimize in your field program. Um, this, again, is just more of a summary of initial investigation techniques. I might look at surface mapping. I might have my limited drilling program, groundwater investigations, and I might be looking at some geophysical explorations laboratory testing, in situ testing, those other items. Once I get to that more detailed investigation, which has been informed by those initial investigations, um, I might be adding that detailed geologic mapping and coupling it with geophysical testing. Um, that was really useful in a, a potential spillway study we did. We went through, we were able to do the initial mapping. We targeted areas for our detailed mapping where we had concerns. And we coupled that with some electromagnetic induction geophysical survey which is walking around with big hula hoops, which attract a lot of people's attention, wondering why we're just carrying hula hoops around this, this rocky area. But using that data together um, gave a very detailed look at um, what we were dealing with in terms of potential spillway erodibility in that location. We have exploratory drilling, lots of laboratory testing, not just the things that are getting transported to the lab, but also the tests that we're doing on site, measuring in situ stress environments, um, groundwater tests, we might be looking at adits at this point um, and, and various rock mechanics. So again, that multidisciplinary approach, natural geologic variability means that no single geologic investigation is gonna answer all your critical questions. You have to be thinking of other investigation sources to fill in your data gaps. And really we're thinking like that weight of evidence approach. Um, we've gone through the developing the drilling program plan quite a bit. Um, so I'll let folks read through this. Um, this is just an example of what that plan might look like for a more detailed plan. Um, I have my drill hole and I have a lot of information in this table about exactly what I'm conducting at each of these drill holes. Uh, one item to always keep in mind, if you are working on an existing structure, 
is you have to know which methods are acceptable for your sensitive structure. Um, every federal agency has their own version of this document. You say SPERC and USBR all have drilling and embankment dams type documents. There's also a lot of references included in the back um, of each of these documents that you can check out if you're interested. Um, just a few other considerations. Make sure you're communicating your uncertainty at all times. Maintain flexibility. Uh, the whole team has to be in constant communication as all of the initial results are coming in. And make sure, again, to communicate your accurate sample collection techniques with hand handling and retention. I see that missing in a lot of drilling plans. One last thing, never conduct your investigation without doing your compliance activities. This is NEPA. Um, NEPA has three levels. The simplistic level is your categorical exclusion checklist. Bigger levels, especially like maybe a new dam site, you might have to go to environmental assessment or an environmental impact statement, which is the biggest and will take years. Um, most of us might be dealing with a CEC for a lot of our, our work. Um, the big thing here is know who to talk to about um, your NEPA activities. NEPA covers environmental aspects, and these are the laws that you are complying with when you comply with your NEPA regulations. You have um, threatened and endangered species um, and other items. Conversely, there is NHPA. These are your cultural compliance activities. You always need your environmental and your cultural compliance activities. You might recognize SHPO. You're going to deal with SHPO when you're doing your cultural compliance activities. Um, this is where you're looking at even when you're not working immediately next to a sensitive cultural site, your work at your site may be impacting that other site. Um, so always work with SHPO. You're breaking the law if you're not. Um, this also involves um, planning with, with other entities, other parties. Um, so, so be sure you know who to talk to if you're planning investigations. This is just to really drive home the point that make sure your entire team is involved and sometimes there's members of the team that are forgotten, um, but, but their input is extremely valuable to making sure that all your investigations go off without a hitch from the beginning. So you don't want to conduct a $500,000 or $250,000 site investigation and get back and realize you missed some critical information that could have easily been grabbed while you were already down at the bottom of these drill holes. Okay, awesome. So if you clicked all of the above, or, or how to manually select all of those, then you're correct. We want to we want to involve everybody. All right. Well, thank you very much. That's part one.